I'm really happy that some people are here, or a few people are here, or many people are here, um, because in the last weeks, I was when I talked about Spring IL, I was asked, what are you talking about? And then I said, layered architecture. And the response was, oh, OK. So it's not the crowd pleaser. It's not the most um, modern topic. But I think it's an important topic, nevertheless. And um, I still think it is one of the most common architectural styles used anywhere, or at least in enterprise projects. Before we start, um, I want to give you three points to focus on during the talk so you know what I'm aiming at. First, this will be about reading data. This is not about writing. It's not about um, communication between services. This is simply about reading data from a database. In this case, from a single database. You can apply it to several databases, of course, but that's what this session here is about. Um, it is about questioning your own habits. You know, sometimes as developers, we do something for so long, and at some point, maybe it stops making sense. And we should regularly ask ourselves, are we still on the right track, or do we need to change something? And it's also to adapting to requirements. Um, I think that's an important point in architecture. Um, you never do an architecture, and then you're done, and you use that for 10 years. There will be new requirements, and you need to regularly think for yourself, do we have to change something here? But why did I create this talk in particular? Um, because uh, it was introduced as my background. I'm a software consultant since 2014, Java developer since 2008. And throughout my career, I have worked with a lot of layered code bases. And I saw a recurring pattern um, at least in bigger enterprise projects, um, where data was loaded into entities, then transformed into a different model, then sometimes transformed into a different model again, and then we had the desired target format. And the problem I saw again and again was with this step. There are potential issues in the transformation and um, these issues occurred in project over and over and over again. This transformation was often slow. So we loaded some data and displayed it on the screen. And we as developers, we knew this was complicated stuff that we did, right? We had to fetch data from many tables. We had to transform it. That takes time. And then the user comes around and says, here, there are three rows of text on my screen. Why did I have to wait three seconds for that? And it's a good question. It's often hard to maintain. Um, there are a lot of tools and libraries to help us transform data. Um, but if we have to transform data over and over and over again, and at some point, this transformation is a major part of our code base. So every time we change something, we have to adapt the transformations too. And that can be quite a hassle for some time. In general, that makes developers unhappy. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be unhappy at work. Of course, these problems can be avoided in new designs. We are all here on Spring I.O. We have seen a lot of great talks on architecture already, um, be it uh, Michael Blöd, Oliver Rothbaum, or Tom Hombergs. Um, there are a lot of talks about modularization, about components, how we can do it better. But we don't all have that, let's call it luxury. Enterprise projects are really long-lived. And uh, just, yes, or just last week, um, we released a new version of a software that was 12 years in production already. So um, you can't, especially as an external consultant, you can't just go there and say, have you thought about rewriting the whole thing? Because it's, well, it is running 12 years in production, so it's doing its job, and um, nobody wants to take money into the hand and rewrite everything from scratch. Let's start with the code. Um, this might be familiar to many of you, if you are using a layered architecture approach that is pretty common. So we have a Spring service class, 
and we are auto-wiring our repository and a mapper into the service class. Maybe the mapper is static. That's also a way of doing it. And um, here we have two data access methods. We have um, find album by ID. Then we call the repository. You say find by ID, and then we map it with a mapper. It's an optional, so map mapper to DTO. Or we have um, an access method for all the entries, find all, and then yeah, we call the find all method from the repository, and um, yeah, chunk everything through a mapper and have our DTO format we want. Um, who knows this pattern or has to use this pattern at work? Wow, okay, good. <laughs> so the mapper, um, please don't get hung up on specifics here. You could absolutely use mapstruct here. You could use builders with Lombok. Um, you could do, I don't know, XSLT transformation if that's your, your thing. Um, but in general, it's like this. You have a function or a method to transform the entity into a DTO. We have some fields which are identical in both, on both sides, the ID, the name, the release date, and here um, we seem to yeah, modify the structure. So we don't copy the artist, this is for a, a music record. We don't copy the artist directly into the DTO, we copy the name of the artist. And here we even have some logic in the mapper. Um, it looks like in the DTO we only want the total playtime in seconds for that album. And here's a method which is uh, summing that up. I'm not sure why there is sorting in there, but why not? <laughs> sort before summarizing. So, and um, this seems a little superfluous, right? We have a service and we call the repository, we transform everything and then we give it to the, um, to the REST controller or what you have. And I was asking, why do we do it that way? Why do we need a service class that does nothing than mapping? And I was asking this question at clients projects, at um, former coworkers or friends. Yeah, we talk about coding in our free time. Um, and some of the answers was, yeah, that's just how you do it, right? We've also do always done it that way. That's especially in German, often a legit answer, um, because Germans don't change really, um, or not readily. And, but I wasn't really satisfied with this. Okay, we have always done it, but why? I asked on Twitter, and some people blamed Sun, and some people blamed IBM. Um, and this is not without a foundation. Um, I tried to find early references on that architectural style, and I found this one here. Um, designing web services with the J2EE 1.4 platform, JAX RPC, SOAP, and XML technologies. Um, there's a lot of words um, in there that developers have strong feelings about. <laughs> um, it was published in November 2004, and it was the first reference in the J2EE area where I found the concept of layering and of doing a persistence layer and passing the entities upwards and modifying that. Before that, there was an even older book from 2002. Um, this was just talking about J2EE without the 1.4. And there they had those um, database objects. So you had, for example, um, a user object and you passed it into your service layer and you called um, user dot add salary, and it performed immediately on the database. So somewhere around that time, um, the theory is that the concept was introduced to sell more application server licenses. If you were around at that time, I would love to chat afterwards, because 2004, I was 15. Um, I was starting to begin my emo phase and um, was asking my brother to buy alcohol for parties. So um, J2EE was not on my mind yet. I wasn't paying attention. So one answer on the question, why do we do, this, would do everything that way, um, keep coming up, kept coming up, because we want to decouple things. And that's a legit answer, right? Decoupling is good. That's sometimes, um, as a developer, all we do is think about decoupling and decoupling all the time everything. 
Um, and yes, it's a good direction, but we need to keep in mind that decoupling is a tool and not a goal. Nobody pays us for decoupling things. They pay us to build amazing stuff, and decoupling may be a goal to, uh, tool to do that. Um, so yeah, let's, let's follow down that road. So now I'm talking for 10 minutes without touching any of the topics, really. Um, but now let's take a look at layered architecture. I was trying to find out where this approach was formalized. And I was not, um, I'm not really sure if I found the first one to write about this, but if you find a resource for Martin Fowler, you have to use it, right? So, um, Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture. It's a great book, although it's from 2002. Um, if you are working on enterprise applications, I can really recommend it. And now the first question is, what is an enterprise application? Enterprise software, according to Fowler, is mostly for internal use. So a company writes um, enterprise software for itself. It handles a lot of data and a lot of complex data. The data is current, concurrently accessed and modified by a few users. The software is usually integrated into a system landscape, and hence it has many interfaces that it provides and that it consumes. So we are coupling our application with a lot of stuff. So what is layering? A layer, and um, I'll do this, this quickly because I guess this is, um, for many of you, if you have raised your hand that you use layered architecture, um, that it's not news to you, layers up subsystems. And we compose those subsystems in a way that information flows through the layer in a special order. So you can see here, we have layer A, B, and C. And if layer C wants to know something, it asks layer B, layer B asks layer A, and it goes the other way back. <coughs> layers should not be or must not be aware of any layers above them. So if we see layer A as the base layer, layer A doesn't know what layer B wants to do. It doesn't even know layer B exists. Layer A just knows somebody is calling me and I'm giving information, and that's all. No dependencies from layer A to B or from layer B to C. So, and usually, and that's the first point that is only partial, partially true, a layer only calls the next lower layer. So layer C asks layer B, and so on and so on. Benefits and downsides, and that's a direct quote from the book. That's why I put the shorts on the bottom. Um, the good things. We can understand a single layer as a coherent whole. So if I'm working on layer B, I don't have to care about layer A or layer C. If I'm writing front-end code, I don't have to worry about the database. So um, I know I have a very hard time keeping focus on things for a long time. So um, having this peace of mind in, to concentrate on one subsystem and forgetting about all the other parts of the application, that's a huge benefit for me. We can substitute layers with alternative implementations. That's the classic response. Um, who in this room has ever changed a persistence layer? Okay, some. So from, from SQL to another SQL database, or did you throw out a relational database and edit MongoDB? Okay, that's an open question. That's not ideal. Um, so, okay, it's, it's theoretically possible. And uh, this is the main point why the layered architecture appeared according to Fowler, because um, earlier in the days, um, there was something that was called terminal server architecture. And um, usually the code was running on one machine, on a host, and um, people intertwined the logic in the front end and the logic in the back end. So it, it was just a big ball of mess. And then the web appeared, and people said, oh, okay, we want to display our data in the web. And all the companies who separated the logic and the display code in very clear layers, they were the happy ones because they could just substitute the UI with a new web layer and were done. And the other ones went bankrupt or something, I don't know. Um, so this is where everything emerged. We can 
change out a front end, we can change out the database, we can change out anything um, because we have clearly defined interfaces between layers. This is because we can minimize dependencies between the layers. So if your um, presentation layer knows what Hibernate is, you might have done something bad. So you call um, methods from your persistence layer and that one knows what Hibernate is, what JPA is, um, but that shouldn't matter to your, to your uh, presentation layer. Layers also make good places for standardization. I think that's not so relevant for us enterprise developers. Um, the example here is that network communication is layered. So you have um, the wire, you have the drivers, you have TCP, you have FTP on top of it. And obviously, yes, that makes for a good room of standardization. I'm not standardizing the user access for a banking application. That's not one of the priorities. And once you have a layer built, you can use it for many higher level services. And that's interesting um, because what's not to like there, right? We load the user and we don't care what is done afterwards. So everybody should use that same load user method, right? We'll see. The bad things. Um, layers encapsulate some, but not all things well. As a result, you sometimes get cascading changes. Um, use case, we will take a look at uh, later anyways. Um, please add a new field to the UI and store it in the database. How many layers do you have to touch? All of them. So cascading changes. And extra layers can harm performance. At every layer, things typically need to be transformed from one representation to another. And this seems to fit with my talk title pretty well. So in general, um, my experience currently in enterprise projects, banks, insurances, logistics, um, this is how we build apps. We have a persistence layer, usually with JPA. Um, we have a domain or service or application layer. It depends on uh, which book the architect read last. Um, and we have a presentation layer, which could be a REST controller or maybe a JSF page, if you're unlucky. Um, and everything's displayed there. And with this, we are doing more mapping than Christopher Columbus at his time. Um, we have a DTO. It comes in via REST controller. We have to map it to the data format of our application layer. Then we have to map it to a JPA entity to save it in the database. Um, then JPA returns the updated entity to us, and we have to map it again, and again, and again. So a lot of mapping code here. I had this um, on the screen, I don't know, 10 minutes ago, and um, we can find some parts of this layered approach here in our schema. Loading is done in the persistence layer, obviously, and the displaying is done in the presentation layer, obviously. But where here is our service layer? Where is the need for our service layer? We don't need one. Not all of the time, especially not for reading. And um, this is something that is laid out clearly in all references to layered architecture. It is okay to open layers. It's called opening layers. The presentation layer is allowed to access the persistence layer. I had harsh discussions about, uh, discussions about this with architects and with clients because they said, no, this is not allowed. And we have our arch unit rule that says you cannot uh, require a repository from a controller. It's forbidden, we don't do that. So that's the first takeaway, please. It is completely okay to open layers. If they don't believe you, tell them Martin Fowler said, you so, uh, said that to you. They won't argue with him. We still need to transform data, obviously, but um, we can cut out the middleman, the service layer. Okay, that's for now the first theory part about layering. Um, I want to summarize that very shortly. So we want to minimize our dependencies. We want reusability. We want to provide data access methods to the upper layers that can be reused. Um, we want flexibility. So we want to throw out um, 
the Oracle DB and now be hip and store all of our data in the blockchain. And for me, a very important part is we can lower our mental load. We can take a look at one of our subsystems, one of our layers, and understand everything that happens there without knowing about other layers. But, and I think this should be said for all architectures, this is not set in stone. Once you decide on that, you can change your mind. You're not politicians. So um, if you say, okay, we have decided that, um, and it made sense at that time, but maybe it doesn't make sense anymore, you can change that. Can you change it in 12-year-old enterprise legacy applications? Maybe not so much but you can chisel away from the stone. Maybe without people realizing, if you're sneaky. So I'm going to introduce an example now, and I want to add a disclaimer. This is a conference talk, and the example is fitting my slides very well. That's not a coincidence. Um, and your use case might be different. So please don't um, take the slides and say, ah, that guy from Germany said uh, this and that. We now do this exactly like it, and then it doesn't work. So your use case might be completely different. Um, I'm a big fan of music and live music, and I'm happy that live music is returning. So um, I built a small example application, which is displaying information about music records. I chose uh, Leviathan from Mastodon because it's one of the best progressive metal bands of uh, albums of all time. And I wanted to show that um, not only that weird J2EE 1.4 book appeared in 2004, but uh, also other stuff that is very complex, frightens a lot of things, but is in the end quite good. So we have an HTTP service, and we have a flat representation of our data. We have the name, the release date, total playtime, number of tracks, and the artist name. And this is our data, how the data is stored. We're good developers, so we are using a relational database, we are doing normalization of the data, and we have three tables. We have the track, the album, and the artist. So if the artist uh, renames themselves, we can just change that in one table, and the change propagates to everywhere where we read data. Again, the three arrows. We have relational data, which we are loading. We have flattened JSON that we want to display. And in the middle, we need to transform it somehow. What problems could there now be? With the layered architecture approach I showed you earlier, um, one of the problems is the data is not really decoupled. So we have seen that code already. Um, and yes, you might say, OK, the objects or the, the classes are decoupled, right? We are abstracting the changes away, and we can change both classes independently. The issue is the classes are decoupled, but the data is not really, because it is a different technical representation of a data in the same domain. So if we change the way the data is stored, that's the example from before, we want to add one new field to the display, uh, to the presentation layer, then everything cascades through our whole code base. We adapt the database, we adapt the persistence layer, um, we adapt the first mapper, the service layer, the second me um, mapper, and the DTO, and some guy in our web front end has to change the TypeScript code too. So that's not a big issue. We are doing this, we, we can handle this, um, but yeah, we're transforming an awful lot of stuff, and if that stuff changes, we need to adapt it by hand. And this fits really well to one of the downsides um, that Fowler described in his book. Layers encapsulate some, but not all, things well. As a result, you sometimes get cascading changes. We won't get rid of those changes entirely, but maybe we can minimize them. Problem number two is performance. You wouldn't do this, right? So find all, you stream it, and then you filter by one ID you want to have. That's the stuff the junior developers do on their first day, and then they get a slap on the wrist, and they don't do that anymore. The database can filter faster, obviously. 
You also wouldn't do this. You wouldn't load everything and then sort it in your code. Right? The database was built for that. The database is much better at sorting. So, no, don't load that. I don't think anybody in the room does that. Maybe if the sorting is very complicated and needs some other data sources. So, why do we do this? Why do we load the entity over the wire, load it into our memory, and then transform it? When the databases are built to do that, relational databases are built to transform data fast. There are very intelligent people working for a long, long duration of time on those database products to do exactly this, transforming data. And why is this an issue? Why can't we just load the entity and transform it? Um, because in this ER model, um, we can see that we don't really need many of those fields, right? For the flattened JSON representation, we need um, the artist's name, we need from the album the name and the release date, and we need uh, the duration in seconds. That's all we want to have. And oh my god, we haven't seen that yet. Um, the description column is a Varsha 4000. So we don't need to display that. And if we load the entity, we load that every time and send that over the network. And not only that, if we load it as an entity, we join the track table on the album, so we have as many rows as the album has tracks. And then we have that Varsha 4000 in every row, 12 times, 20 times. Um, and that's a lot of stuff on the network and in our memory we don't really want to have. So maybe filter that out as soon as possible. Bonus question, and this is one of my fun JPA rants. Um, are we free from side effects in this code? And uh, I posted that on Twitter a while ago and I got quite a discussion. Um, we don't know. Because of JPA's lazy loading, which makes sense in some cases, um, if we just take a look at this mapper class, we can't tell if artist and tracks is already eagerly loaded or if an access to that getter triggers a load to the database. So, and um, I'm anonymizing this, but um, in one of my projects, um, we had a data model cons uh, that was spanned over 250 tables. It was a big project, so it was justified. Um, and we had a lot of pressure and worked really fast, and we had to put out features. Who am I telling this? You're also developers. And so um, there was not always time to do things the right way. And of course, there was no time for performance testing. And um, we put everything in prod, and we got a call from a user, and they said, I wanted to display 500 records and the browser timed out. We said, oh, that's not good. That's the timeout after 60 seconds. 500 records shouldn't be load, take uh, 60 seconds to load. And uh, we looked at our monitoring and we had Instana, so we saw all the tracing. And uh, we, we realized that under the hood, in spring, um, the process timed out after 60 minutes. Because of lazy loading in the mapper, we were setting off 120,000 subqueries, and um, no, sorry, it was 10 minutes, not 60. Sorry, um, but it's yeah, no user interaction should take 10 minutes to load, right? And this is what was uh, happening there. We had um, a lot of lazy loading. We had a lot of relationships. We weren't able to load everything eagerly from the start, um, and in the end, I guess we had 10% of the database in the memory. Those mistakes are very expensive. Um, you lose trust with your users. You lose um, time because you have to fix it. Um, and for us developers, it was just embarrassing. So um, not a nice feeling. Um, so this performance hit does not really map to the layers, but um, it is something to be um, to have in mind. So um, if the more you map, obviously every mapping operation costs some time. Yet not that example um, that I had before. But um, mapping is something that has a cost. 
So now I'm chewing your ear off for minutes and minutes in how we shouldn't do it. And um, like a good salesman, I'm now offering the solution. How can we improve the reads with SQL? That's, by coincidence, the title. Um, how did we solve that issue with the 10-minute transaction with the 120,000 subselects? We wrote an SQL statement that had around 200 lines of code, was structured with common table expressions, you can do that, um, and suddenly the re request only took three seconds, which is still long, but we put a lot of data into that. And um, yeah, that can be a solution partially, not for everything. First, um, we are fetching directly via Spring JPA projections, or via Spring data projections, into um, uh, an interface, which will again, then get a proxy. You can also select into a, a class. You don't need to do an interface. The important thing is, this is not an entity, and there is no lazy loading involved. You have everything in there. The interface, in this case, uh, looks like this. Um, Spring Data does everything under the hood automatically. And for a long time, that's not new. What's even better is, we process the data in the database. So we apply everything, the logic, where the data is. We don't send everything over the wire and then throw away 90% of the data. We can do um, sums in the database. We can count stuff, and on the bottom, we are grouping stuff. That's basic SQL syntax. Um, and I guess most developers who are familiar with SQL would read that and say, yeah, that's standard SQL. There's not even any obscure Oracle um, proprietary shenanigans in there. This means we only fetch one row per album. We don't have to fetch the album with the artist joined and then all the tracks and then um, compress this on the client side again. So if we fetch 10 albums, we fetch 10 rows and not 120, which is smaller, obviously. And if you use Spring, and if you're already using Spring Data, you have no additional dependencies here. It's just something you already have in your toolbox. You don't need to argue with an architect for a new dependency, you can just do it and decide for yourself, um, no, I want to do it differently here. The last time I held this talk, I published the slides online, and I had around 10 people under my tweet asking me if I hadn't heard of JOQ or Juke, and um, so I had to promise to mention Juke, obviously. Um, I'm using it, I'm a very big fan of it. It's not part of your common spring stack, it's an external dependency, that's why it's just um, included as an additional mention. Um, oh, sorry. And um, it allows you to create type-safe SQL statements without criteria API or HQL or HPQL, uh, JPQL. So um, very close to SQL, very good to abstract away the characteristics of your database. And with that, we can select the data directly into the desired structure. This doesn't only hold up for a layered architecture. You could also do hexagonal architecture with that. You select directly into the format you need. You don't go all the way via the entity and the mappers. You have less data on the, on the network and less data in the memory. Yeah. <coughs> Just wanted the slide where two people high five. I Always positive vibe. And you have faster processing, because the database is much faster at processing data as your Java code probably is. Shouldn't say that at a C conference. Um, because databases are built to do exactly that. I have a, um, yeah. Additionally, if we skip the entity, we can, um, yeah, capitalize on the fact that we can skip layers, we can open layers. So now, our controller, our Spring controller, looks like this. Um, we inject the repository directly into the controller. As I said, there are projects where ArchUnit um, does not like that. 
how it is configured. And we can tell, okay, um, find album summary by ID, map to, um, if it's, it's an optional, so if it's present, pack it into the response entity, or else send out not found. No service in the middle, and no Java mapping code. We have reduced code. Um, for a different project, I did some obviously non-representative metrics. Um, I used um, open tracing and Honeycomb to uh, set up a load balancing test for my app, and I hit a REST endpoint with um, JMeter. I guess it was around 200 concurrent accesses and threads and 20,000 calls each. And in the red box, you see um, the duration or the average duration for when I went um, and fetched everything into the entities. Per, uh, in average, it was 72 milliseconds per call. And in the green box, um, you can see the spring data projection style. That was um, 50 seconds on average, so you, uh, milliseconds. So you saved 20 milliseconds per call. That's not nothing. The third one I'm not talking about today, um, you can also, with almost all modern databases, you can produce JSON in the database and just send it out, but that was a little too spooky for today. So, I'm saying we should do this all the time now, right? No, there are no silver bullets. This has, has been uh, told at this conference uh, at least two times when I was present. And this here is obviously not a silver bullet too. This is not in every way superior and I have not found a new secret way of software development. Um, because you are writing specialized queries. If you have many consumers of your persistence layer, these can get a lot. And suddenly you are writing a lot of SQL code or Juke queries. And if you now have a change in your data model, you have to change all those. So, yeah, we have mapping code, but it's now on SQL, and we can test this. Test containers exist today. There's no um, excuse to not test your SQL. Also, no excuse to test locally with H2 and then roll it out to Postgres. Um, so we can test that, and if we change something and it breaks, our test will fail. But we have to adapt all of those queries. And that's effort, too. So the question from the beginning, why did we do it that way? Why do we load, or did we load data into the entities and then process it and um, yeah, carry it on? Because it is easy to maintain code bases doing it that way. You have your, um, I don't know, album repository dot find by ID and you load the album. If you need a different format, you give it to the, um, to the layer that, it, that needs it and then it transforms it and shapes the data into the way it requires. And that's easy. We have one data access method. If we write native SQL for every single use case, we might instead have 20 data access methods, and that's more code to maintain. So um, I'm not saying never do that. So use the repository uh, methods still. But if you realize that there might be a performance overhead, if you realize you don't need all the data, then you might use these SQL mapping approaches in certain spots to speed up your application and make your users happy. Obviously, if your application has three tables and two users, don't bother at all. Just do the old stuff. That's way easier and not worth the effort. To summarize, I'd like to start with the benefits. Um, this does not violate layered architecture as described in the textbook. Yes, we now have knowledge about our presentation layer in our persistence layer, but we don't have hard dependencies. So this flat album representation, if we change the presentation layer from uh, HTTP call to back to JSF, um, the chances are that we need the same data structure. So we can still use that method from the persistence layer. 
the front end still does not, um, the, the persistence layer does not know of the technology in the presentation layer. So we have still that decoupling going for us. We can improve read performance. We have seen that. Um, I have experienced it. So partially in the uh, places where we need it, we can make our application load data much faster. We've reduced the complexity of our Java code. So yes, as we have seen, um, we have fewer mappers now. We still have to do mapping. We still have this mapping in SQL. But if we um, cut out the middle layer, um, we can get rid at least of two Java mapping classes and replace them with one, with one um, piece of SQL code that maps. Obviously, there are also downsides. We have many slightly different SQL queries that we have to maintain in parallel. And nested complex projections might get messy. If you load um, from a table and you want to load two tables as a relationship, then you, uh, if you join both, you get a Cartesian product. And then it's very hard to just grab your data and uh, combine it again. Um, I told this to somebody um, on a last conference, and then they said, have you heard about Juke? <laughs> Um, because actually, Juke can do this. I think it's called um, nested sets. I'm not the expert on that, but um, they found a way to work around that. So uh, yes, you can do this with Juke with one SQL query, with one single statement, really fast. Um, but I'm not here to make um, to advertise them. Yeah, finally, um, pick the ingredients you need for your architecture. So. Um, if you have the layered architecture, it's unlikely that you can build components out of it. It's unlikely that you can switch to a hexagonal approach that might suit better. Um, somebody decided that 12 years ago. Nothing was changed. Yeah, um, in Germany we say the Hamburg Salat. Um, that's the salad. And um, if we have a way of doing small improvements, um, then there's no reason to not do them. Um, maybe except when the architects are really stubborn. That was it, uh, everything from me. Um, I have added some contacts here from more formal to less formal from the top to the bottom. Um, you can find me as Java Hippie on Twitter. Um, and I thank you all for coming. Thanks.